Hi, in this video I'd like to give you a brief overview of some general instructional methods that we'll be covering in this course. Before I start talking about the instructional methods though, I first want to give you a little bit of an introduction about me since you are new to this course. And I would also like to talk a little bit about which instructional methods tend to be chosen by various teachers and for what reasons. First, a little bit about me. I'm a former reading teacher as well as an English teacher and reading specialist in high schools in Central Florida in the Orlando area, especially Sanford, Florida area, which is 30 miles outside of Orlando. Um, my background, in addition to the teaching, I was born in Pittsburgh, spent a large part of my childhood in, in the Boise, Idaho area as, um, from about age infancy to age eight, Klamath Falls, Oregon briefly, back to Pittsburgh uh, from age nine to 12 and a half, then down to Central Florida, the Sanford area near Orlando. Uh, Sanford is uh, famous for some um, awkward reasons, of course, but um, as well as it's a very nice town, go ahead and look it up. I still actually own a home there, and my father's there. Lived there for a long time, taught high school there. And um, after that, I went on to Clemson University for my PhD. Got a PhD focused on English education. I have got a strong background in English language arts as well as reading. I was an assistant professor of English education and education in general at Harris Stowe State University, which is an HBCU, historically a black college and university in the Midtown St. Louis area. I was there for four years, program coordinator of middle and secondary education. And of course, now I'm at University of Arkansas Little Rock. Happy to be here. Okay, so a little bit about why people chose what instructional methods and for what reason. It does vary depending on the theories of learning that you buy into, as well as by your field, of course, but I especially want to focus on theories of learning for just a second. This course is not focused on that, but it's worth talking about. Um, if you are a believer in transmissive views of learning, behaviorism, for example, the, uh, the idea that learning is transmitted um, directly, a teacher-centered approach, um, and uh, then you tend to buy into direct instruction type of methods. If, on the other hand, you are a believer in constructivist approaches to learning, uh, for instance, type of approaches favored by Bogosky, Piaget, then and Dewey, uh, then you tend to be a believer in more uh, student-centered, learner-centered approaches to instruction. Now, I'm making this video for multiple classes, uh, so hopefully uh, if you're an undergraduate, some of this will be a little bit new to you. If you're a graduate student, this will be old hat to you a little bit. Um, you do have my permission to skip through a little bit. If this, some of this is a little bit um, old hat to you, at the same time, I'll try to bring in enough detail, enough theory, for instance, that my graduate students will find this very useful to you. I also want to point out, as I move along, uh, some various ideologies of instruction that are out there that influence why a person would choose one approach to instruction as opposed to the other. For instance, there is an approach to instruction, an ideology called perennialism which believes, and if you've taken an, an educational foundations or philosophy of education type course, you should know about these. Perennialism believes that it's important to make sure that people have an understanding of the classical ideas that have influenced us from the days of Athens, Greece, uh, the days of Rome, the Renaissance, the great ideas, the great books of classical literature, uh, physics, philosophy, um, Latin, Greek, the humanities. This approach to instruction tends to be very conservative. It's passing along um, the heritage, if you will, of the culture, of the mainstream culture, I would add. And so those forms of instruction tend to put a strong emphasis on Socratic method of dialogue as well as lecture. Uh, if you're a believer in what's called social efficiency, um, social efficiency 
in an educational foundations course puts a strong emphasis on let's make sure that we prepare people to be competitive in the world in the most efficient way possible. It's very much a factory model approach to instruction. Places a strong emphasis on standardization. Places a strong emphasis on high stakes testing. Uh, this form of instruction at the administrative level, at the high stakes testing level, has become dominant in K through 12 schools and it is increasingly becoming dominant at the university level too. This approach, again, tends to favor direct instruction, Socratic method. It tends to favor uh, behavioristic um, approaches, approaches drawing on behaviorism from B.F. Skinner. Uh, the idea that, as you are often told when you're prepared about how to do your lesson plans, make sure that any objective for what you want student to learn can be measured, can be tested. Well, that's behavioristic. You want to show in an observable, testable manner that students actually have learned. It's not enough for you to make the claim that students have learned. That's um, kind of a truism we tend to prepare students with when we prepare students with grid lesson planning techniques because the lesson planning techniques that have been passed down from us from the 1950s era of the evolution of the curriculum design world drawing on Taylorism and Bobbitt are very much drawn from behavioristic, from behaviorism. Then, of course, you've got approaches such as pragmatism, drawing on John Dewey, uh, the idea that, again, knowledge is constructed, knowledge is a result of a habit of reflective thinking, continuous, um, open-minded ways of growing from reflecting on evidence. This tends to be very project-based. If you've heard of project-based learning, most of you I'm sure have heard of project-based learning is favored by pragmatists. Sometimes the field of pragmatism is also called uh, student-centered or learner-centered instruction or child-centered movement. Um, that is going hand in hand with social constructivism. Social constructivism draws on the approaches of Piaget and Vygotsky. Now, there are some similarities, differences beyond, um, between Piaget and Vygotsky. If you really get into the nuts and bolts, there are actually some pretty significant differences between Piaget and Vygotsky. Piaget um, placed a little bit less emphasis on showing the social interactions um, within what Vygotsky would, would call a zone of proximal development. Um, Vygotsky placed a strong emphasis on the zone of proximal development. Zone of proximal development basically is this area in between what a student can do with competence independently and what that student can do with assistance. And according to Vygotsky, uh, the best instruction, the best as well as the best learning takes place within this zone of proximal development. And so what does that mean? It means that your assessment of student learning should constantly be telling you what can the student do independently compared to what's the maximum that the student can do with assistance and gear your instruction toward this ever-changing, ever-evolving zone of proximal development. That means dialogue. That means exploration. That also means guidance, guidance by a more expert other, be it peer or a teacher. So that tells you something about the instructional methods that tend to be used by social constructivists. Now, again, you can see there are various schools of thought here. And I'm not a believer that there is one single best method of instruction that works well for all students at all times. It varies depending on the needs of the learner, depending on the context, depending on the situation, depending on the ability level, depending on exceptionality of the student, be it giftedness or a possible um, cognitive or physical uh, disability, 
depending on the emotional state of the student. There are so many factors that need to be taken in. In this brief video, I'm not going to have a chance to talk as much about that. But before we go into some of these instructional methods, I believe it's very important for me to highlight the importance of differentiation of instruction. Okay, sorry for the delay there. Uh, my uh, keyboard was going a little bit slow. Okay, so this discussion is primarily going to be geared toward method of instruction in middle and secondary schools. That being said, I will, because I'm making this video so that it can be used with multiple classes, I will talk some about uh, elementary and early childhood too. I'll mix that in a little bit. But just so you know, this is primarily going to be geared toward middle and secondary um, lessons, a little bit of my, about my own background. I have taught university courses at the undergraduate and graduate level that are geared toward all grade levels, K through 12. Um, I've been a consultant for K through 12 schools at times, primarily drawing upon in Florida, my background working with um, schools and with low SES levels, um, the schools that serve predominantly um, students that were lower income and uh, high levels of diversity in the schools. I got involved in school reform work when I lived in Florida, so that's a little bit about my background there. Okay, first of all, I'm a believer that instruction should be systemic. It should take into account relationships with students. I would also add care with students. You've got to build that relationship. And there's got to be, there's a classic book, it's classic by now because it was published in 2006 uh, by Michael W. Smith and Jeffrey Wilhelm, um, drawing on flow theory. Flow theory is a, uh, flow is a psychological state of intense engagement in activity purposeful, so intensely focused that you can lose track of time. While doing research on instruction that was intended to help students reach a state of flow, what Smith and Wilhelm also found is that there is a type of contract to care that exists. Uh, I tend to talk about contract to care so much in some of my own classes. Sometimes I worry that my students might think that this is my own concept. It's really not. It's published by Smith and Wilhelm. Uh, for any one of you that have seen me face to face and hear me talk about the contract to care, you remember this is Smith and Wilhelm 2006, going for the flow. Okay, so with the contract to care, if a bottom line is that if a student enters your classroom, already caring about the material and about what you're teaching and about and shows a, a love for reading, a love for, uh, for the material. If you have a disinterest, you break that contract to be a caring teacher, then at some point it's very possible that that student could in turn also become increasingly disinterested. On the other hand, if the student enters your classroom a little bit resistant, having had bad experiences in schools, possibly angry, apathetic, uh, using phrases like, I hate reading. But you, on the other hand, fulfill your contract to care. You care about the student's needs, interests. You care about being an effective teacher, about your classroom instruction, as well as knowledge about the content, then that student is more likely, there's no 100% guarantee, but more likely to begin to care and to give this a chance. That's the contract to care that goes into the big R. It goes into relationships. The conditions of learning, both outside the classroom uh, what is the student's living condition, all that stuff, as well as the learning environment that you set in the classroom. That's extremely important to consider in your instruction. The processes that you use, um, are you lecturing? Are you involving group work? What's your body language like? Um, in what way are you guiding students? All of this helps. Feedback based upon assessment is also important. Uh, feedback can take many, many forms. Uh, it can take a simple 
uh, feedback such as, I love the way that you did this and why? Don't forget the why part, uh, because that makes the difference between, between a self-esteem qu- uh, feedback and a self-efficacy feedback. Self-esteem means you're good enough, you're proud enough. Um, it goes toward your sense of um, your general esteem. Self-efficacy means I have confidence that I can do a specific task with success. Four ways of building a student's self-esteem in general. Help the student have the following four I statements. All of this goes toward feedback. One, I have sufficient knowledge to to do this task. For instance, let's say the student is reading an increasingly challenging task. I have sufficient knowledge of how to break words down, how to understand my reading strategies, how to use my reading strategies. I have sufficient knowledge that it takes to successfully read this text. Uh, Number two, um, I have sufficient skill. So again, I have the sufficient ability, sufficient command over reading strategies to sufficiently read this text. Three, I have been given sufficient training. That goes toward confidence in you as a teacher. That goes toward the relationship with you as a teacher, as well as other teachers. Uh, That goes toward confidence in the level of teaching that the student has been given and care and relationships and guidance that the student has been given. That's a huge important part of building efficacy. efficacy. Then, of course, the fourth, where the rubber meets the road, is I have overcome challenges. That's where experience comes into play. If the student in reading a text can look back on overcoming similar challenges with similar um, challenging texts, that student is more likely to have self-efficacy in reading that text. Self-efficacy is strongly, strongly, strongly related to perseverance. Lack of self-efficacy is also strongly related to lack of perseverance. Now you can see why. There's nothing horrible about a self-esteem type of feedback. You're so smart, You, I'm, I believe in you, that sort of thing. Nothing wrong with that, we all need self-esteem. But I also, as you give feedback, I want your feedback to be specific enough that it helps build self-efficacy for students. To do that, you need to effectively observe the student. You need to be doing both formal as well as informal types of assessment so that your feedback is meaningful and specific to that student. It's important to develop your toolbox. Um, A single method of instruction cannot meet all instructional goals. Think about what we've been talking about already. You've got different theories of instruction, different theories of how students learn uh, that inform instruction. You're also going to have different students in your classroom, depending on the diversity of the school in which you teach. You might have in one single 20 student class. You might have some students who are second language learners. Some of these might speak different languages as their first languages, Spanish, French, Chinese, etc. You might have uh, students with an exceptionality ranging from giftedness to reading disability or dyscalculia with math, etc. You might have physical disabilities of students within your classroom. You might have students with different levels of interests. You might have students with different passions. All of this goes toward your methods of instruction. It doesn't mean that with 20 different students, you need to make 20 separate lesson plans. That's absurd. But it does mean that each student will learn in a slightly different way Um, And it means that you need to be an effective teacher at differentiating instruction enough that you meet that student's need. A single method of instruction cannot accommodate all learning styles um, and needs and students all at once. Different students do have different ways in which they learn the best. And that means it's important to have that toolbox. One method of instruction that's popular out there is called transmissive, transmitting, 
uh, think of, of course, about, you know, if, if you're transmitting a signal um, from TV uh, to, the per, uh, to the person watching on TV, that's a transmission. Uh, it, for instance, direct instruction. The teacher delivers content typically through lecturing or demonstrating. Now, one thing I want to stress here, sometimes based if you've had previous teacher educators who have given you the impression, maybe emotionally in uh, our non-intended ways that we do it, that transmissive teaching direct instruction is bad, that's not the case. It's not that it's bad, it's that you need to vary your instructional methods based upon the needs, interests of the students and based upon the situation. There are times when well-planned, effective, direct instruction is absolutely the best way to do it. Uh, there are other times when direct instruction might not be as effective as other forms of instruction, for instance, project-based learning. It depends on the setting, it depends on the context, it depends on the situation, and it depends upon the strategies that you use, of course. If you give direct instruction for, let's say, one hour to a bunch of, I'm giving extreme situations, a bunch of sixth graders for one hour without anything and direct instruction, let's say, in the form of a lecture, so a one hour long lecture to a bunch of sixth grade students uh, just exactly like I'm doing sitting, let's say, let's say you're sitting in a chair uh, in front of your classroom to a bunch of sixth graders talking like this with your arms folded, looking like this, your voice like this for one hour to sixth graders, you're going to lose the class. Uh, so, so there are times when, depending on the way in which you do it, it's not good. But on the other hand, Sometimes direct instruction done in very specific ways oh, in which you, for instance, give students specific feedback. You're very careful not to overload the students with too many concepts at once. Um, Ausubel, um, look them up, A-U-S-U-B-E-L, um, has done a lot of work in the area of helping you plan how to give direct instruction. If you do it in very specific ways, sure that you're not overloading the student, uh, then with carefully planned direct instruction, sometimes it can be the best form of instruction that you can possibly give to that student. Here are some good ways of doing um, effective direct instruction. Make sure that the concepts uh, that you're teaching about are very clearly defined, as well as things like your objectives, your goals, um, your procedures. Bottom line is you don't want students to be confused about the direction that you're heading or about the concepts that you're covering. Make sure that things are clear in a student's head. Lessons should be very well organized and sequential, step by step by step. Provide opportunities for guided practice. Uh, this, if it sounds a little bit similar to I do it, we do it, you do it, the um, instructional approach made famous by Fisher and Fry, which draws upon Pearson's work on scaffolding, then yeah, it's, it is similar to that. Uh, so guided practice is very important. Provide opportunities for independent practice. Again, I do it, we do it, you do it. Now that approach is not as formulaic as maybe you've learned in past situations. For instance, sometimes it isn't always I do, we do, you do. Sometimes it may be you do, I do, we do, etc. And sometimes you can vary the, vary the steps, you can vary the length. You need to differentiate. It's not a lockstep, formulaic, rigid thing. Uh, instruction really should not be rigid. It should be uh, flexible to the needs and interests of the students. Provide opportunities to revisit, reuse, and reapply concepts. If a student is totally confused, but you've covered the material, that's not good enough. Instruction is not just about coverage. Instruction is about learning. It's about growth of the student. Teach the student, not just the content. I need to make sure that that's very, very clear in your mind. It is the student, 
it matters not whether you've simply covered something. You need to make sure that you define your goals when you're giving direct instruction. The students will learn blank. Be very specific about that. Behavioral objective, behavioralism, a lot of uh, approaches to direct instruction are very much drawn from behaviorism. Students will be able to blank um, in the process of your instruction. How will you know that learning goals and behaviors are met? You know that through different types of assessment. Make sure that you clearly define these. The learning experience of students should be very clear and very explicitly defined. Make sure that you're not vague um, in your planning of, a, of direct instruction. Notice what also comes into play here. I know of many, many teachers who think that direct instruction can be weaned um, off the cuff. That's not really what I recommend. I want you to engage in very careful planning of very strong, very purposeful direct instruction. How will, um, will students do things? When will they do things? Where will do they do things in a very sequential manner and why? Okay, so again, you should make sure that your lessons are very well structured, which takes careful planning. Your learning activity should be sequential. Your steps should be planned and very carefully planned in terms of your delivery. Modeling should be included. If you're um, having students read a text, model the reading strategies that you use. Think aloud, for instance. If you're having students write, then model your writing approaches. Model how you as a writer engage in certain types of writing. That's where things like anchor texts comes in to play when it comes to writing instruction. An anchor text, of course, is a good, well-written text of the genre and type of writing that you're asking students to do that the students can use as an example of good, high-quality writing. Uh, so again, this gets into examples that are provided. Students should understand exactly what's happening and exactly what they are expected to do in a very well-structured, well-organized manner. Okay, some keys with direct instruction. Make use of graphic organizers, and there are different types of graphic organizers. We know uh, from a dual coding theory um, that students make use of information in both um, linguistic, language-based ways, as well as non-language-based ways, images, pictures. We know that attention to a picture, to a graphic organizer, to something non-linguistic can help a student to also pay attention to the language, and it can help a student to understand a concept in a deeper, more um, rich, nuanced way. And you can see on these clips here, I recommend that you um, click on these clips that I provided in this uh, PowerPoint for examples of how to use graphic organizers effectively. Well, you'll notice in my instruction, it's, I don't want you to just simply listen to me talk and read the articles. I, want, I also want you to see uh, practice in action. Be careful about cognitive load. In a nutshell, cognitive load theory is this. We take in information through our senses, sensory input. It goes in, uh, this information passes through sensory memory. It takes a very short amount of time to pass through sensory memory. But if sensory memory is overloaded, because uh, we can only hold so much data in our sensory memory at once, then you get overload of your sensory memory. That's one reason why you sometimes have sensory overload if you've been in a room with too much happening. Uh, if you've ever gone to, let's say, a haunted house and there's lights and groans and moans all over the place, they're making use of the idea that sensory overload can cause confusion. Something you want to keep in mind with your students. Don't overload your students' sensory input when you're presenting information. Sometimes I go into classrooms 
where there frankly is sensory overload. You've got the walls so busy and cover, colorful and all kinds of things happening. And you've got all this dancing light and fluorescent stuff. And I've seen all kinds of things in classrooms. Well, sensory overload can occur that can actually inhibit learning. Don't take me the opposite way. I'm not saying that your classroom should be all brown and ugly and boring with nothing on the wall. I'm not saying that, but be careful about sensory overload. And once um, information is passed through sensory memory, it goes, of course, in a short term, sometimes called working memory. Uh, we can only hold, hold a limited amount of information, again, limited bits of information in our working memory. Um, that's one reason why chunking is so important or turning something into a song or a rhyme is so important, limits uh, the bits of information that it takes. Uh, so again, be very careful about not overloading working memory. If working memory uh, gets overloaded, then it doesn't pass into long-term memory and it, it doesn't get stored into our schema, the way in which we categorize um, information in, in a meaningful way within long-term memory. So be very, very, very careful when it comes to cognitive load. You don't want to overload your students. Um, that's important in direct instruction. It's something that really should not be ignored in all forms of instruction. So information is either processed or discarded based upon working memory, uh, like I just described. Um, and you want to make sure that you're chunking in an effective manner. We just talked some about cognitive load. It relates to the amount of information that working memory can hold. It has a limited capacity. You make sure that you don't overload your students. Okay, some more about cognitive load here. When the brain processes its information, it categorizes that, and it then goes into long-term memory, where it is stored schemas. Um, this is kind of kind of like file cabinets, uh, different depending on your uh, form of learning theory that you buy into. Some people view schemas as being equivalent to file cabinets. Sometimes view uh, some people view schemas as more of a networked, uh, kind of like a spider's web or the way that uh, computers operate. So it's, you've got this network, um, uh, and by computers I really mean multiple computers networked along with each other in this path. Um, so there are networked learning theories out there. For instance, connect, connectivism. Uh, in learning theories that believe that schemas are more a matter of network than simply file cabinets. Uh, that still is open for debate. I don't, it has not been 100% agreed upon as a consensus in the field. Bias here, I tend to believe in schemas that are more networked. Um, but um, bottom line is, and distributive, but bottom line is uh, this, it does pass in long-term memory. Um, depending on how it's used. And again, you can see Richard Meyer talking here about cognitive load theory. If, uh, please click on, click on some of these links that I'm providing. Direct instruction is tied to, again, guided practice, sequential, very carefully planned steps, and you need to be using formative assessment to track progress so that your feedback can be specific enough. Make sure that you provide opportunities for independent practice in addition to the guided practice. Focus on very specific types of practice of the learning. Do not expect mastery to occur in a single lesson. And you want to make sure that you revisit concepts to build on higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. An important thing here. There's nothing wrong with memorization. You have to memorize something in order to get to the higher levels. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with lessons that focus on memorization. But let's not leave out eventually making sure that we get to the higher levels, the analysis, uh, this, uh, the synthesis, and so on and so forth. With modeling, uh, visual as well as verbal, um, as well as other forms of modeling are very, very important to demonstrate your practice. 
And then we get uh, into indirect instruction, uh, that where the teacher and students arrive at content to be learned through transactions, through dialogue. Oftentimes, if we're talking about, for instance, perennialism, uh, where we would be talking about Socratic methods of dialogue. We get into behavior modification. That again, if it sounds like behaviorism, it is. Um, oftentimes we talk about behavior modification as a classroom management technique, but it also relates to learning. You want to emphasize the development of effective systems and efficient systems, in the se sequential learning tests that shape behavior. That's very important to take into play with direct instruction. Give the students opportunities for observable behavior that the, the students need to observe both from peers as well as from you how to do things. Uh, demonstrations and presentations are vital when you give direct instruction. There are some approaches to instruction that are very managerial, top-down, um, indirect as well as interactive, facilitative, individualization, group management comes into play here. We get into information processing. This deals with uh, how students process information. Uh, you want to think about how students handle stimuli from their environment. I talked some about inf information processing theory earlier with schema theory. Uh, there are different uh, theories of, in of information processing out there, but bottom line is you need to think about how is information uh, being processed in both in sensory memory in uh, working memory as well as long-term memory and with long-term memory it's very important to think about the connections both in terms of how a student is going to organize information within long-term memory as well as how a student is going to recall and uh, make connections with prior knowledge prior knowledge is so important precisely because of these connections that are needed within the brain in order to effectively store and recall information in long-term memory Okay, so we need to think about memorization, problem solving, as well as different methods of reasoning with inquiry. The teacher can guide students as well as help make uh, students make meaning for themselves. Now, these things are not separate. I would recommend having the idea that you guide students in a manner that is always intended to make sure you're guiding students toward independence. Uh, so in other words, you've heard of scaffolding, this type of guidance that is supposed to take place. Uh, for instance, um, think alouds or uh, using helpful clues, helpful tips, timely reminders. Um, scaffolding is supposed to uh, take place within the zone of proximal development, important to this type of guidance is independence. Scaffolding is always, it's not meant to be a crutch. It's meant to be a temporary crutch. Notice the difference there. It's always meant to guide toward independence. It's not supposed to be permanent. Okay, then we get into dialogic uh, forms of instruction. Dialogic gets into indirect as well as interactive teaching, Socratic technique that I've been mentioning. You can see I've provided a link on there about an example of Socratic uh, technique and dialogue. I would strongly encourage you to please click, uh, click on this link for an example. Uh, Socratic method, um, think of what, what you're of. Uh, Socrates is famous for in the dialogues of Plato. Uh, present a situation, a context, ask thought-provoking questions, and continue to interrogate until eventually you can come to a consensus. The students want to interact with each other. Um, the students can also interact with course material and the teacher is on hand to make sure that they're organizing it. That's again, careful planning. Okay, you want to make sure that interactive instruction emphasizes relationships uh, between students and the teacher. These relationships are extremely, extremely important. You want to make sure that you give opportunities to the students to relate to them, partner as well as group collaboration, role playing, group inquiry is extremely important. 
Okay, at this point, I'm going to pause. We've been discussing this for 40 minutes, and I'm going to continue this with a second video shortly. Uh, please watch both parts of this video uh, for this full lesson. But I'm going to pause for a second because I think watching an hour-long video is a little bit much. I try to limit my videos a little bit. So this was part one. Take care.